welcome. Uh, so we'll start uh, with uh, the firstly the general questions uh, for all of you. Uh, so uh, the first question was going to be, uh, so you've all been very successful in your own field and they are uh, mostly related to material science and engineering. And I was just wondering uh, what made you choose uh, material science and engineering or science uh, scientific career in general? Uh, or in other words, uh, when and why uh, did you become interested in material science and engineering? So I'm from a very small town in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. Uh, and we didn't have a lot of science and engineering there. So I, I really like math and chemistry. Uh, so when I went to undergraduate, I thought I would be a chemical engineer. And I really disliked chemical engineering. It was, it was mutual. Uh, it also didn't like me. No yeah, no offense. Um, and so um, I went to talk to my advisor and I said, well, these are the things I really like. And he said, well, well you want to be a material scientist. But I was from, I didn't know what material science was. So uh, I ended up, you know, getting into material science that way and started taking the intro class and you started doing research. And actually the research I started doing my freshman year is the kind of stuff I still do today, right? So for me, it was just the way um, my brain thought about the problems was the way a material scientist thought about the problems. So I kind of naturally fell into it uh, and was lucky enough to be, you know, given that chance uh, to work in materials. So it's actually very interesting. Actually, when I was in high school, senior high school, so I was thinking about, oh, I love physics, I love chemistry, not math, chemistry and math. So I thought, hmm, what should I do? Because I don't think that I want to go into pure science or pure engineering for that matter. So I decided to go to material science and engineering. And that, that was actually uh, something that I never regretted. So I went in doing, um, not knowing very much at the start, but then as I progresses along the, 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 the whole course and then at the end to do a project, it was really nice. My, my project was actually on metals, nothing to do with polymers or nanostructured materials like what I'm doing now. Yes, yes, yes. But then the, the, the metals open up the possibility of doing characterizations, advanced characterizations and looking at things and understanding how things behave and how structures comes about and stuff like that. It's really exciting. But when I first, after, after graduation, I did not choose to become a scientist. I chose to become an engineer. Right. So I went out to work first. Mm -hmm. And then I decided that after working, working is very exciting, of course. But then um, I realized that I'm, I'm limited to what the companies is interested. Then I went on to do a PhD and, and that, that I never looked back. It was an excellent experience so far. Yes. So uh, as I mentioned uh, in the previous question, you've all been uh, renowned experts in the field. Uh, of material science and research and, and those fields related to those. Um, could you briefly describe your research interests um, and maybe uh, what you think are the current bottlenecks uh, of pushing the boundaries further uh, for your own research field? Yes, I work in a, a field that we call, or well, mainly work on organic semiconductors. These are kind of molecular materials that you can design from the bottom up as a by organic chemistry and then um, I'm a physicist, so I'm trying to understand the way these materials work, uh, both at the deep fundamental level, but also at the level of understanding structural property relationships. And so it's a, quite a challenging task in the sense that these are complex materials with complex microstructures and really working out their physics and then feeding that back into the chemistry to make progress on materials performance. It's a very uh, it's something that has fascinated me for a long time, and I um, and it's. That's the way how these materials have made it from the lab into industrial applications. And I find that very stimulating and fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, work at, I'm working at DuPont and uh, electronic uh, and uh, industrial division. Yeah, uh, I'm in charge of the R&D organization of the advanced cleans technology, which deals with nanoscale uh, defect and cleaning. Uh, and we develop the cleans with the selectivity, uh, you know, with the different surfaces. And uh, yeah, we try to uh, develop the products uh, that can clean uh, and then we're resulting in the better yield in the semiconductor process. So yeah, that is, you know, what I'm involved in and uh, you know, what I'm looking for. Yeah, the, the major problem here is that like uh, we are about to move into a three nanometers, you know, process. And then you know, so they're talking about the 1.4 nanometer for the next generation. And now it's time to uh, like 
to, to develop a creative solution. Uh, the problem that, you know, uh, the phenomena that has no uh, problem uh, in before and uh, now it become a serious, you know, problem that kills yield. So that I'm looking for the resources. And you know that the job market in the semiconductor business is very hot. And uh, I hope more, you know, talents uh, from the MSE uh, of uh, SNU. Uh, yeah, I can recruit, of course, you know, the good talents here. And then, you know, I, I believe that they can, you know, deliver the creative, you know, idea, out of box thinking, uh, with a proactive, uh, yeah. Actually, for for my case, I work a lot on nanostructured functional materials. So we design how molecules can impact the the different phases in materials, and using this in things like sustainability related and energy related applications. So rather than bottlenecks, I think there are challenges, I think, or, or things which we don't consider previously. One of it is, of course, the, the whole life cycle of a materials design. So generally, we design materials for functionality. We forgot about what happened at the end of life. So I think the, the challenges that's coming ahead is actually perhaps to think about how life, uh, how, how the materials can then be degraded and then used or upcycle some way to get complete cycle uh, for the materials. And then the other thing is actually is material stability in some of the applications, perhaps in organic electronics and a lot of other applications. I think stability is another challenge that we have to always tackle as well. So these are the challenges, I think. Right, right. yeah. So as, as you mentioned, I work on functional complex oxides. So these are materials that you know, have some kind of deterministic response when you, when you poke them uh, with a stimulus. And you can use these things from everything from memory and logic to sensing and energy transduction and, and the like. And um, you know, they really keep you kind of agile because you can move around and do lots of different things with them. But I think moving to the near future, as we start to push the, the envelope of next generation microelectronics and nanoelectronics, you know, one of the challenges for our field is we've never been forced to make these materials and study them at the at the length scales, the time scales, and, and the energy scales that we're really talking about for utilizing these materials in these, these next generation devices. And so that opens up a whole bunch of uh, unanswered questions in, in this field and really even asking, how do we, how do we study these things at those fundamental uh, limits of these materials? So I think it's an exciting time for, for these materials. So um, the material science and engineering department at SNU is very um, proud uh, to have all these um, different disciplines coming together uh, and being unified as a single department. So uh, the most um, representatives are uh, the three individual departments, uh, metallurgy, um, ceramics, and the polymers, um, all unified into a single department. And um, with respect to that, what do you think are the strengths uh, of the uh, material science department at SNU, uh, especially um, our department? Particularly. So, what I, I mean, from what I see from um, we, the time that we've spent with your department and the faculty, I think the the some some very very obvious strength in your department is actually the faculty is actually very internationally trained. So they can be trained in US, they can be trained in UK. So so they, they have some form of exposure, which is really nice. I mean, it, it seems to bring back that culture, of that open culture. And also, I think that the faculty amongst uh, faculty seems to be very collaborative. You, you share resources, you share opportunities. I think that's actually very exciting. It's very especially good for young faculty, I think. And I think the other thing that we all agreed on is actually the industry collaboration that you have. We have very strong industry ties, and this is actually a very unique strength for MSc in SNU. Yeah, I was very uh, impressed by the you know the spectrum, broad spectrum of the you know the project and program in MSE and the metal, metallurge and the five uh, polymer and, and uh, the, the battery uh, program. So actually, uh, this is what we need, like interdisciplinary uh, you know, effort. And this is what we need in the semiconductor, not only semiconductor, you know, other, you know, cutting edge, you know, technology. Uh, basically, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, what, there, there are many cases, one LOB line of business was looking for the, you know, solution which was already available in other, uh, the, the field. So that, you know, collaboration between like different technology, yeah, can be, uh, can expedite the, you know, progress. And yeah, we are witnessing uh, many cases. So yeah, I, I, I was able to see that kind of like a uh, you know, very good, you know, work efficiency in the MSE. So, and I, I saw also, you know, effort by the faculties 
uh, to uh, develop the, you know, uh, the, the the department uh, to the like in a direction uh, that uh, that is very uh, the industry uh, focused and you know, like the battery and uh, you know display. Uh, so that yeah, I was really uh, impressed. So um, I personally find that almost all uh, fields of studies are now uh, being very interdisciplinary. So um, the boundaries between each discipline is fading now, uh, so that they're all coming to one, uh, unified or also integrated. And I was just wondering, uh, do you have any suggestions or comments of how uh, departments of material science and engineering um, could actually all uh, material science department worldwide, not just uh, SNU, uh, should plan ahead in terms of educating and uh, planning uh, the students uh, for the future. So I think one advantage for a material science department is historically we've been very interdisciplinary to begin with, right? We're bringing lots of different approaches uh, together in, in one place. And I think that sets those departments up um, to really make impact going forward. So I think embracing that and, and, and building it more in and, and trying to get your students working with each other and across these, these boundaries between the historical areas like ceramics and electronic materials and metals and things like this. Um, and at the same time, I think one of the other strengths for, for the department here is this connection with industry. And, and that provides uh, a contextualization of, of the real problems that, that are out there uh, and being able to translate those challenges into fundamental questions that a material science student can, uh, can address can be really impactful. And, and you can see the whole life cycle of an idea of a material play out very quickly. So I think embracing those, those aspects would really kind of continue to, to make the department very successful. Well, I think it's similar. I mean, what, what's impressed me over the last two days is that I think I've got the feeling that this department is not a, a kind of collection of individual research efforts as, as such, but there is a real genuine effort to collaborate and to, to work on a common purpose. There's a number of initiatives where people try to build up bigger programs together, um, joint, joint uh, initiatives to establish facilities that allow um, people to work more effectively and, and try and attempt bigger ch challenges. And I think my, my encourage, I would encourage the students here to, to make use of that, those opportunities. I mean, not to just narrowly focus on their own kind of research um, top projects, but actually make use of the opportunities and learn about techniques that are available in other groups, learn about challenges that are kind of relevant in other fields, because often when you look in detail at these questions, you realize that actually there's quite a lot in common and there's a lot you can learn from, from people who work in, in apparently different directions, but actually if you, if you make use of that knowledge and the technical capabilities that are available in other fields, you can make very interesting discoveries. And I think it would encourage people to make use of that opportunity that they have here. So after all these questions, um, do you have a few words that you'd like to share uh, with material science department? Uh, uh, sorry, the students uh, at the material science and engineering department at SNU. Uh, any kind of words will be welcome. I think I share this word with also our own students as well in Singapore. So, so generally I ask the students to to actually to be daring to venture out of their comfort zone, that's actually very important. So it goes into how they, they learn and it also goes into how they expose themselves to various opportunities as well. So they, they have to suss out the, the, the opportunity to work with others, I mean, from different fields, from different opportunities like going for exchange programs or even, even to, to find opportunities themselves. I mean, they can, they can go to professors and say that, I, I want to do this. Uh, do you think that you have something that can support me in doing this? I think professors are generally very open with this suggestion. I think the, 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 the ability to, to think, to imagine what you can do, I mean, sometimes it's of course, it could be, you could think that, I mean, as a student, you could think that that's ridiculous, but there might be something in it. I mean, it's just whether if you are willing to explore. I think that that part is very important, I think, for students. Yes, definitely, yes. Well, yeah, I found that, yeah, first of all, I was very impressed by the their English. Uh, <laughs> so I didn't see that coming, yeah. And uh, I, mean, I think the MSc students, including the undergrad and the grad students, they need to know uh, that they are very lucky to be part of the, you know, just such a, you know, big uh, department with the diversity and, uh, you know, Seoul National University is a big organization 
and then you have a lot of chance to uh, get the advice from the different professors. And you know, as a like I'm in industry, so I know that how expensive it is to get the you know advice from the SNU University, uh, the faculty members. So you ha you have a free access uh, to the faculty members and enjoy the free advice. Yeah. You've been at SNU uh, for the last two days, or maybe you've visited um, the uh, university before. Um, uh, if you could just have everyone uh, uh, in short words. Um, what, uh, tell us what their favorite parts of SNU is, uh, then we'll be grateful. I would say my favorite thing about most places is the people, okay. right? And the, and the energy that those people bring to, and the passion they bring to their work. Well, I would say uh, pride. Yeah, okay. I was able to feel their pride, you know, you know being uh, like a student of uh, number one you know, university in, in Korea. So yeah, they, they have a, like a, yeah, yeah, I was able to feel the responsibility from their face to be a number one. Uh, so the pride is uh, uh, impressed me. Um, I have to struggle to find the other. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have to say you you have a beautiful campus. Ah. Yeah, your 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 autumn colors is wonderful. So I have to say that the location. I think the students are very blessed to have such a nice location. I think for me it would probably be. I mean, you, as a as a reviewer, we come to a country and don't really know much about the academic system, and so. But I think what I've sensed is that there is a real openness to new ideas. Um, it's not a kind of very rigorous system, and if you if you can find ways to do things better, you were very willing to try them and and, and implement them. I think that's I found that impressive, and the way you welcome and receive new faculty and make them feel at home and, and support them. I think that's also very, very positive. We are always um, interested in making international collaboration, uh, expanding further uh, as a department at SNU. And I was just wondering, how can we promote um, more international uh, collaborations with your institution in particular, or in more bigger picture between Korea, uh, US, uh, UK, uh, Singapore and also uh, to the industry. Uh, so how can we build better connections between SNU and each of your institution? So I, I would say uh, we're already, even at the grassroots level, building uh, quite a few connections. I have six students and postdocs who are from Korea already in the group. And I think the best way is, is getting those people to, to sure. do exchanges, right? So coming for PhD, coming for postdocs, that really builds these these long lifelong connections that are I think the most powerful and productive for for really doing innovative work in the future. Yeah, I, I was actually about to mention this. You you you, you initiated this BrainLink um, project, um, and I think that's a, a great opportunity to build some more yeah, intense collaborations. Um, and I think. I, I, I'm personally always very sad and seeing the kind of science system becoming more polarized. In, in, UK, in the UK, we had Brexit, the US-China relationships are deteriorating. So I think any opportunity to build international relations like this is very welcome because we need to counteract these, these tendencies. And so, yeah. I'm, Actually, Singapore and, and, and Seoul is not so far away from each other. I mean, it's a, it's almost the same time zone. It is the same time zone. So actually, it's a it's a it's a natural connection. Other than exchanges, I think we can also think about perhaps some joint collaborations between us and also the Korean industries and some of the companies because we also have a very strong presence of um, a, a Korean industry research mm -hmm. in Singapore as well. I mean, Hyundai just set up their research laboratory, and then I think these are opportunities that we should explore. So DuPont R&D policy is that the locate our core R&D where the customers are. So yeah, you know that the Korea has a very strong industry in the semiconductor display, battery, and so on. So the uh, DuPont Korea is try to locate uh, the expand our R&D capability, uh, so called the KTC uh, Korea Technology Center. And, and I hope like uh, we can strengthen uh, our collaboration, not only project and you know, also in you know, talent hiring. So I have a plan to invite some of the MSc students to DuPont, not only DuPont Korea, but also DuPont sites in the uh, US. And then you know, provide the chance for them to meet uh, Korean global uh, R&D leaders. Yeah, we have many. So yeah, so that you know, I, I'd like to remind like uh, DuPont is a real uh, global player 
uh, that will provide a career development opportunity from the local hiring. So I haven't actually prepared this question, but from uh, asking you all of these questions, um, I was just wondering, it would be a nice thing to just end our interview uh, with um, any encouraging words um, to uh, the Korean students uh, who will be mostly watching uh, this um, video um, from uh, SNU, especially our department. Uh, I know uh, you've had very successful cases of the Korean students or Korean researchers at your institution uh, or in your group. So if you could just uh, tell us some encouraging words uh, for uh, the perspective of students uh, in you know, uh, whether they could explore um, worldwide um, uh, research opportunities or how to progress with their career further. Yes, I think I, 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 my impression is that Korean students and, and particularly students from SNU are very well prepared to go abroad and they're very well educated here and you've got a very solid foundation in, in kind of most techniques and most kind of scientific methods that you will need um, for when you go abroad. And so I think you should, I, I would certainly encourage you to approach any foreign venture with confidence um, and be really courageous and ambitious to make the best of it. I think uh, you are very competitive. The students from here are extremely well um, educated, so yeah, you, you can look forward to making having a really good time abroad and making your stay very successful. I, I would say um, we consider the the top Korean students to be some of the top students in the world, and they're very well prepared. They know the fundamentals, but they're also um, you know bring this kind of excellent combination of. Of, of diligence and hard work, but but creativity and 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 passion for for the research. And so, um, my experience with them is that you can give them very hard problems, and they will figure it out uh, without me having to do so much at the end of the day. Uh, and that's really what we're looking for in kind of the the most creative people that are out there. So, um, yeah, I think be confident. Uh, don't don't worry about English as a second language. Uh, we're, we're very welcoming, we're, we're open for business, and we want people to come and, and participate, and we'll, we'll work on it together. I think I'll give my opinion in terms of Korean faculty, I mean, Koreans who, who turn faculty into mm -hmm. our organization. I think they, they are very, uh, definitely very resourceful, uh, which is very true. I think I think this is actually based on the years of training overseas. I think they are, they are very resourceful. and. They are very good communicator. The language is never a barrier. I mean, whether they speak well or not is, is not that important. But they're willing to communicate. I think that is actually very important. And the students are, are very much excited by what their professors are teaching. So I think it's very wonderful. This is uh, just my uh, personal opinion, like you know, about the Korean employee uh, working for the global company. So if their capabilities are one hundred percent, then you know sometimes uh, because they are too shy, and and so that the, you know they they get you know only a seventy percent of the recognition. Maybe uh, there is a language problem, but you know when I visit here, when I had a conversation with the students here, and I was really uh, uh, shocked. And and they are so confident, and they had no problem to express themselves in in, in English. So yeah, they, they have to know their capability is much more than they uh, think. And uh, don't be shy to escalate anything. And uh, you know, people are you know, surrounding you to support you. So yeah, I think, uh, yeah, they said like, uh, you know, students here are ready. So I think you are ready uh, for the, you know, the, the any uh, challenge and get out of the you know, comfort zone, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for your time.